Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, uh, I enjoy every so often getting into one of these videos that just basically is showing us a map and then allowing things to unfold as they did historically during some event, typically a war, but also sometimes colonization or other things like that. So this one comes from Emperor Tiger Star, and I'll put the link in the description if you want to check out his channel, because he's got a lot of these kinds of videos on his channel. This is the American Civil War every day. Uh, so what I've done uh, in this particular case is I've turned the sound off and I've slowed it down to half speed. It's about a five minute video and I feel like that's gonna go by pretty quickly for us to really be able to talk about some of these events. But I think it's a unique way to look at the events as they unfold because in looking at a map, it helps us to understand the exact and ever-changing strategic situation and talk about and understand maybe why some things happened when they did and where they did and how they did. Uh, so as always, uh, I invite you to check out the, the original content. Uh, he's got a lot of great stuff over there. The link's in the description. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. I'll probably pause a lot, just so be prepared for that. And I've toyed with the idea, by the way. Um, somebody, I think it was actually um, JD from History Underground who said on Instagram that I should make t-shirts that say this. But uh, uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan. And there's that famous, famous quote where... Uh, Tyrion Lannister says, that's what I do. I drink and I know things. Uh, somebody commented the other day and complained that I pause every 30 seconds and comment. And I uh, found myself wanting to say, that's what I do. I pause and I explain things. So that might end up a t-shirt. We'll see. Thanks for the idea, JD. So this video will show the changing front lines from Fort Sumter to final surrender. So Fort Sumter is April 1861. And we'll probably pause right off the bat just so we can kind of talk about exactly what's happening at the beginning. So at the very beginning, you'll notice all the yellow in the middle. Uh, there were kind of waves to the secession crisis that unfolded. Uh, the Deep South, or sometimes the ones that were called the Cotton States, uh, are the first to secede beginning with South Carolina. Uh, so you can see that as of April, this is, let's see, South Carolina uh, secedes in December. So December, January, February, March, April. We're five months into this thing, four or five months into it. And at this point, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina have not seceded. That only happens in Virginia. That only happens after Fort Sumter. So you'll see those dominoes start to fall after Fort Sumter. So there goes Virginia. There's the, the blockade begins. So Winfield Scott is the commander in chief of Union armies at this time. He's a brevet lieutenant general, which is kind of an honorary title. He's, his full uh, generalship is major general still. Um, and he devises what's called the Anaconda Plan, which is basically to squeeze and strangle the South into submission, blockade their ports so they can't trade their cotton and other stuff, so they can't import what they need, take the Mississippi River and divide the Confederacy in half. That ends up eventually being the strategy that works. Uh, so then you'll see the other uh, northern slave states start to secede, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina. Um, you see the Union um, kind of taken. Maryland probably secedes if the Union doesn't intervene and send troops into Maryland to basically hold it by force because, look, it surrounds Washington, D.C. Um, so at this point, Lincoln has issued a call for troops, initially 75,000 volunteers for three months, which is the max that he can do under the law until they change the law. And then they'll, uh, they'll extend the uh, length of the enlistments once they realize it's going to be a longer war. You see right now, one death in battle. I'm guessing that this is Elmer Ellsworth, who is a... Uh, officer, a Zouave officer who is shot by a hotel owner in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, coming down the steps after removing a Confederate flag from his flagpole. Uh, you see the initial movement is into West Virginia, and that's George McClellan in command of a lot of those troops. And there are some early successes. The first kind of real skirmish takes place at Philippi in West Virginia. Um, and you're going to see Maryland completely fall under Union control. Missouri is going to follow suit in the early months of the war. Uh, and this is pretty much what is going to happen 
Um, July 21st, we're going to have the first Battle of Bull Run, uh, but nothing is really going to change there. You see the Confederates moving into New Mexico territory. They're taking the southern part of what will be called Oklahoma now. At this point, we're into August. You can see the number of battle deaths are fairly low. Um, the majority of those coming at first Bull Run. But uh, not a lot of battle deaths. Remember, two-thirds or more of all the deaths that happen in the American Civil War happen as a result of disease. And that's common in all warfare up to the 20th century uh, and into the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and now at this point, uh, Kentucky has gone from being yellow to being blue. Uh, within a day or two of each other, Kentucky was officially neutral. And they wanted to stay neutral. And so both sides were trying to honor that neutrality. But then Confederate troops and then Union troops under um, General Grant are going to move into western Kentucky at almost the same time. And so now all bets are off. Neutrality is off. You're going to see the Confederates move into the southern parts of Kentucky. And right now, as of November 1861, as McClellan has taken over command of the Army of the Potomac for the Union, um, things are not going to change a whole lot. You're seeing movement up into Kentucky. That's going to happen again with a Confederate offensive that's going to go all the way up into northern Kentucky uh, in the early part of 1862. But then we're going to start to see things dramatically change. You see the Union's taking a little bit of uh, ground here south of Charleston. And you're going to see a lot of that along the coast. The Union's going to use their major, you know, before air power, it's all about naval supremacy, right? And so the, the Union's got just dominance in terms of Navy, and they're going to use that to dominate both the ocean but also the rivers. Uh, and you're going to see that early on, uh, is that the combined movement of Grant and Andrew Hall Foote, who's a, a naval officer, uh, is going to help them to be able to take Nashville. Uh, at this point, you can see right there, they've taken, uh, they're taking Fort Henry and Donelson, which guard the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers right here, which you can see how important those are. They both run into the Ohio River. Uh, and, you know, right here, you've got this river here, but that runs to Nashville. But more importantly, you've got the Tennessee River here, which runs all the way down into northern Alabama, up here over to Chattanooga, and then up into eastern Tennessee. Uh, and once Forts Henry and Donaldson's, uh, Donaldson are going to fall, uh, they can't protect Nashville. The Confederates can't. So that becomes the first Confederate capital to fall. And now we're going to see Grant move south. Uh, and keep in mind, still at this point, we're looking at, what, 6,000 total deaths. At this point, a year into the war, there are as many deaths in the first year of the war as are going to happen at the Battle of Gettysburg in three days. Uh, so now we're about to see, watch these numbers jump up dramatically. And this is why the Battle of Shiloh was so just numbing to the public. Because at that point, there are, throughout the first year of the war, there are, let's see, 7,000 dead. And now watch how that number jumps up here in a couple of days with the Battle of Shiloh. Boom. Boom. Now we've got over 11,000 dead. Uh, just from that one battle, it went up by that much. Shocking, shocking numbers, the death toll at Shiloh. Uh, but now you see most of eastern Tennessee is going to fall under the Union, most, or most of western Tennessee. Most of eastern Tennessee is already pro-Union in sentiment. Uh, now the Navy basically single-handedly takes New Orleans, which is by far the largest city in the Confederacy. This is a major blow to the Confederacy at this point. Eastern North Carolina has fallen. You've got the Union Army now under McClellan moving up the peninsula toward Richmond. You've got the Valley Campaign happening between Stonewall Jackson and a number of uh, Union armies. So take a look at the situation as we get into July. New Orleans, largest city in the Confederacy, has fallen. Most of Tennessee, most of pro-Confederate Tennessee is fallen. Northern Arkansas has fallen. Missouri and Kentucky, border states, are well in Union control. The Union's got an army sitting right outside the capital of Richmond. A massive army that could take Richmond, except McClellan's convinced that there are 200,000 Confederates defending Richmond. And so McClellan 
because and and because of Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign, there are tens of thousands of Union soldiers that McClellan wants to come down to help him in Richmond who can't because they're dealing with Stonewall Jackson. Uh, so this is the point at which things look bad for the Confederates. They lose Arizona territory, New Mexico territory, uh, but they start pushing back in eastern uh, Tennessee. And you're going to see now um, some pushback up into northern Virginia. We're about to get the ba second battle of Bull Run. Lee's going to go into Maryland. Uh, we're going to see Braxton Bragg go up into what's sometimes known as the Heartland Offensive or the Kentucky Campaign. Look at how far he goes. He wins the Battle of Perryville, but is eventually forced to push back. He gets right at the doorstep of Cincinnati, Ohio, not far away at all. And so just in just a couple of months, look how things have shifted uh, in favor of the Confederacy. This is now Robert E. Lee is in command of what is now the Army of Northern Virginia for the Confederacy. Now we're looking at battle deaths around 43, 44,000 uh, a year and a half into the war. All the Confederate gains in Kentucky are now gone. Most of the Mississippi River is under the control of the Union. Uh, in the South, you're going to have Nathaniel Banks is going to have to press up uh, and try to take um, a Confederate stronghold there. The, the key, though, is going to be Vicksburg. And at this point, Grant's making an effort to try and take Vicksburg. They're going to have not so good results. We're about to have the Battle of Stones River in Tennessee as the Confederates again are pushing back toward Nashville. And you can see even northern Alabama has fallen uh, to the Union. But that's... Um, you know, we've got Memphis, we've got some raids going on here. We've had the Battle of Stones River now. Now there's a Confederate raid up into Missouri. We're going to get another one here with John Hunt Morgan in just a couple of months. That's going to go all the way up into Northeast Ohio. Uh, so now we've had the Battle of Fredericksburg. The Union and Confederate armies uh, in the East are basically sitting uh, in this area. And for the rest of the war, uh, with the exception of Gettysburg here in July of 63, Everything in the East is basically going to be between D.C. and Richmond, with a few minor exceptions. Um, Grant's about to make his big final push now on Vicksburg. And you can see now the Confederates have pushed back uh, in Tennessee. They've taken back some of that territory. Uh, here comes Grant now to make his final push on Vicksburg. We're going to see Chancellorsville happen uh, in April of 63, late a April of 63. Uh, here goes Grant now. He's going to cross down here. There goes uh, a, con a Union raid. New flag for the Confederates, as you can see. Um, still just 44,000 battle deaths two years into the war. We're at 44,000 battle deaths. Keep that in mind. Here goes Grant now. He's going to take Jackson. He's going to come around, lay siege to Vicksburg. Uh, we're going to see... Eventually, the whole of the Mississippi River fall under their control. More of eastern North Carolina has fallen at this point. Uh, and honestly, we're about to see, here goes Lee up into Gettysburg. Uh, and then that's going to get pushed back. Uh, Vicksburg has fallen. The Mississippi River is now completely under Union control. And this was something Jefferson Davis is fearing big time. Now we're at nearly 70,000 battle deaths after Gettysburg. We're about to have the second bloodiest battle of the war fought within two months of the bloodiest battle of the war, and that's going to be the Battle of Chickamauga. So now you're going to see more of Tennessee falling. Uh, Chickamauga is going to happen in mid-1863. But for the most part, things are pretty static in the East during all of this. So here comes Chickamauga now. We're going to see those battle deaths climb once again. Uh, Confederates are going to make a little pushback here in Tennessee, but it's going to be very brief. Now you see more of Arkansas. Little Rock has fallen. Uh, Missouri River is now under control of the Union as well. Nah, that's not the Missouri River. What river is that? I have no idea. But now uh, this is where we're going to have the battles around Chattanooga. And at this point... Think about it. Very little, for the most part, has changed on the map in the last 
year and a half, except for the Mississippi River, which is obviously a major, major thing. But little has changed in the East during all of this time. Now, here we go. You're going to see um, big inroads by the Union. At this point, honestly, the war's in essence over. The Confederates have missed their best chance to actually win the war. It's just really a matter of time now. Grant is going to be brought east to take command of overall, overall command of the Union armies, but he's going to lead from the field. Uh, so he's going to accompany the Army of the Potomac, which is still led for the rest of the war by George Gordon Meade, who I think does a very good job. Now you're going to see inroads into Mississippi. You're going to see things start to happen in Alabama. And Grant's plan now is going to call for all of the Union movement to happen simultaneously. He wants Sherman to move on Atlanta. He wants movement to happen against Mobile uh, and against other parts of the southwest of the Confederacy. He wants movement, a multi-pronged movement, into the Shenandoah Valley, up the peninsula, and down the overland campaign against Richmond. And you're going to see all of that unfold at once. I think probably around April of 1864. There's again another major Confederate movement up in through Tennessee, but all of these movements that they make are going to be temporary and can't be backed up because they don't have the logistics, they don't have the manpower to sustain these. So they're really just raids here and there to try and harass, try and distract against what the Union is doing. So now you see the squeeze start to be put on Richmond in May. Look how much of uh, Virginia is turning blue. Look at Sherman moving toward Atlanta. Here goes another raid up into Kentucky that fails, ultimately. Another push uh, temporarily to take back the Shenandoah Valley. But again, this is Monocacy right there. Uh, but again, they can't hold it. They just don't have the ability to make these things last. And so now things are going to settle in to the siege of Petersburg. And this is pretty much static in, in the east until almost the end of the war. Even at this point, though, look at the battle deaths. Just over 100,000. Uh, you get the image of it being much higher because you see these casualty numbers. You see 50,000 casualties at Gettysburg. You see nearly 40,000 casualties at Chickamauga. You see multiple battles with 20 and 30,000 casualties. But remember, that's killed, wounded, and captured. And a lot of these men are going to die of disease and not from battle wounds. And so even now, deaths in battle, 120,000 at this point. Um, we're going to go ahead and speed things up now because, honestly, not a lot's going to change. Uh, you're going to see the March to the Sea by Sherman here in just a minute. Now He takes Atlanta uh, in the late summer. Another raid up into Tennessee that's not going to amount to much. Here goes Sherman's March to the Sea. You're going to have the Battle of Franklin. Uh, that's going to, again, just devastate the Confederate Army. Now Sherman has taken Savannah. He's going to march up into South Carolina. Uh, the Union is ready to take Petersburg and Richmond. They're just waiting for better campaign weather uh, for that to happen. Everybody knows that as soon as spring hits, it's over. He's gone up now. He's taken Columbia, the capital of South Carolina. You can see eastern North Carolina has fallen. And now here will be the end of the war in Virginia. Virginia's out. Uh, there goes Sherman. He takes Johnston's army. And that's it. And after all of that, 130,000 battle deaths. Uh, I think that might be an underestimate. Uh, in fact, I want to look this up real quick. All right, so I think I understand the discrepancy here now. Uh, understand that when you see killed, like statistics of killed for a battle, these are recorded typically right in the immediate aftermath, and they're reported uh, by the lower-level commanders up the chain of command. These do not include those who have been mortally wounded who die later. And you have to understand, with the state of medicine and with the mortality of a lot of these wounds, there are a lot of mortally wounded. And so you can see here, 67,000 KIA. These are men who are killed outright on the battlefield, who die instantly or nearly instantly. Um, another 43,000, though, are mortally wounded. 
died of wounds afterwards. So if we're looking at that number of 67,000, that is the number killed outright. So really the battle deaths should be probably closer to double that amount. Uh, Confederates killed and mortally wounded is about 94,000, uh, about 110,000 for the Union. So more like 200,000 killed and mortally wounded is probably a more accurate number. Um, so the vast majority still then uh, are dead uh, from wounds, uh, or not from wounds, from disease. I've seen the number tick up in recent years. I've seen estimates now put it more in the seven to 750,000 range. Uh, for total dead from all causes during the war. Uh, but that gives you a little bit better of an insight. Here's some specific statistics that are pretty interesting. Um, 30,000 died of prisoners as prisoners of war in the Union. Guess what? 30,000 died as prisoners of war in the Confederacy. So this idea that we have that all these Union soldiers died at Andersonville, this horrible thing, it was just as bad in Northern prisons. And the Northern uh Union, the Union Army had far more supplies to give those uh, soldiers. Um, one army commander, that was uh, James McPherson, three corps commanders, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, who I guess it would be Joseph Mansfield, um, John Reynolds, and Sedgwick. Is that the three? I can't think of another one. Reynolds, Sedgwick, uh, yeah, and I guess it's got to be Mansfield. Um, 14 division commanders, 67 brigade commanders, including 32 generals killed in the Union Army. Um, so interesting uh, when you look at all of that stuff. Uh, and of course, similar in the Confederate Army. But uh, there you have it. Uh, interesting stuff. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. As I mentioned, check out some of their other videos. Pretty interesting, uh, pretty fascinating way to look at a conflict from another angle, another viewpoint. So hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.